Here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see this good turnout today. That's what a beautiful day in Oklahoma helps, doesn't it? And uh, the last time we taped, we weren't that fortunate. But we're glad to see everybody. We've got some visitors back from Minneapolis area, and uh, I've got my son and his wife down from Duluth. So uh, the cold weather has just driven them south. Uh, I guess when you guys left, about 30 below, wasn't it? I know it wasn't. Todd and Kim left Duluth, and uh, they're down in sunny and warm Oklahoma today. And uh, for those of you out in television again, we like to just introduce ourselves as a simple Bible study. We uh, don't have any axe to grind. We don't attack anybody, hopefully. And uh, all we attempt to do is let everyone, regardless of their background, just simply see what the book says. And uh, I think it's having a lot of impact. We're getting a lot of mail. And uh, like I said, I think in the last taping, hardly ever does anybody give us a bad time. And we trust that that's the reason. Uh, we're not interpreting my own ideas. We're not hitting any denominational slant. But uh, hopefully just show what the Word of God says. So again, we want to thank all of you out there for your letters, your prayer support, as well as your financial I uh, had a phone call the other day from some outfit and wanted to know who we use for a fundraiser. And I said, we only have one, and it's the greatest one in the universe. <laughs> and he always supplies just enough. We don't have millions on the, on the backup, but we've got enough to pay the bills, and that's all we ask. So again, thank you out there in television for everything. And for those of you who come in for these tapings, we appreciate it, because I would not like to talk to an empty camera. All right, let's just jump in where we left off in our last taping. It wasn't the last program exactly, but at the end of the third program, which would mean there's one in between this, we jumped ahead to pick up a little of the language that in turn sent us on up into the New Testament, and we covered the plan of salvation because it was referring to Israel here being saved and their sin and their shortcoming, and then we showed that perfectly that agrees with even Paul in the book of Romans. But we're going to come back now to where we left off at the end of the third program, and that puts us now in book 63, and uh, we're in the first segment of that book 63, and uh, that won't be ready, of course, until we get two more tapings under our belt. But all right, in chapter 63, we'll drop in at verse 7. Isaiah 63, verse 7. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to multitude loving kindnesses. All right, now we have to understand as we have seen all through the book of Isaiah that the vast majority of even Israel were in an attitude of rebellion and unbelief but in the midst of rebellious national Israel, there was always a what? A remnant. And it's always been that way even before Israel appeared. Probably the best example of a tiny remnant was the flood. When out of the several billion people that were no doubt on the earth, how many were spared? Eight. Now that's a mighty small remnant. But see, that's the way God has always operated. The vast majority of the human race have no concern they're in an attitude of unbelief and rebellion, but it's the remnant that God pours out His love and mercy upon. All right, now let's to show you this. Let's come back, honey, to Isaiah chapter 1, and we're going to look at several of these verses now that deal with the concept of a small percentage of the human race that actually become then true believers. Now that doesn't mean they're religious. There's a lot of religious people. But you see, not all religious people are truly believers. All right, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. Isaiah 1, verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. See that? Not even a large remnant, a small one. And he has left in the nation of Israel a small remnant. If it hadn't been for that, they would have been as Sodom, and they would have been like unto Gomorrah. But it was because of that small remnant. Now that should immediately make all of you think of another instance of when an Israelite, you probably don't think of him as such, bargained with God. Where was it? 
Abraham over Sodom. You remember that? Remember? And he, he said to God, if there are 100 in Sodom, would you spare it? Yes, for 100's sake, I will spare it. Would you for 50? Yes, for 50. And he went all the way down to how many? 10. And for 10, I will spare Sodom and Gomorrah. So since he didn't spare it, what does that tell you? There weren't even 10. But this is the whole concept of Scripture from beginning to end, that God always has that small believing remnant. All right, now let's just jump all the way up, for example, even in the New Testament, and we can go to Romans chapter 9, I think it is. No, I'm in Acts. No wonder it didn't look right. Romans 11. I'm sorry. Romans 11. And the classic example I've used over and over, and I never apologize for it, because it is so easy to understand that when Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal up there on Mount Carmel, now remember, that's Elijah. That's clear back uh, before even Isaiah. That's about, uh, well, over 1,000 B.C. But you all know the story, how that Elijah killed the prophets of Baal, and then old Queen Jezebel heard about it and said he'd be as dead as they are. And what did Elijah do? He ran, and he ran, and he ran a marathon ten times over. Finally sat down under a juniper tree, and so many words said what? Take my life. I'm the last one left in Israel. What was God's answer? Well, we pick it up in Romans as well as in Kings. So let's just see how Paul puts it. Romans chapter 11. Let's just start at verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? Boy, now that flies in the face of a lot of Bible teaching and preaching today. They say what? Yeah, he's all through the Jew. They faded away after the temple was destroyed. Not according to this book. Paul makes it so plain, he has not cast away his people. Verse 1, reading on, For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. In his foreknowledge, he knew everything that was going to come to pass. He knew that the Romans would destroy Jerusalem and the temple, but he also knew that he would always have a remnant. See? All right. Reading on. Don't you know what the Scripture saith of Elijah? Now in verse 2. How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed the prophets. They have digged or torn down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Now verse 4, but Paul asked the question, But what saith the answer of God unto him? And this is what God said to Elijah. Elijah, you're not the only one. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men. Now if we can call 50-50 that there were also 7,000 women, that's 14,000. But even so, out of a nation of 7 or 10 million, you've heard me say it over and over and over. What was the percentage? One half of one percent. One out of a thousand. Now that's a small, small remnant. But it's still the remnant. All right? Now you go on up into verse 5. Now Paul is speaking from his own day and time in about 60 A.D. Even so at this present time when he's writing. There is also a remnant according now to the election of grace. In other words, there was a small percentage of Jews that were following Paul's gospel, and they were coming into the body of Christ. In fact, let me just prove that. Turn, keep your hand in Romans, honey, and let's flip over to Galatians. Galatians, chapter 3. Galatians, chapter 3. Starting at verse 26. Now, this is written primarily to Gentiles, of course, but there were a small percentage of Jews embracing the gospel, and so this is how he refers to them. Galatians 3, verse 26. For you are all, see? No designated race or nationality. You are all the children of God by faith 
in Christ Jesus. For as many as you have been baptized, that is, by the Holy Spirit, into the body of Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for as many as you then have been placed into Christ, you have put on Christ. Now here's the verse I was thinking of, verse 28. So there is neither Jew nor Greek or Gentile. There is neither bond nor free or rich or poor. There is neither male nor female in the body of Christ. We're all the same. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. All right, so now flip back to Romans 11 again. And this is why we can refer to this remnant of Jews who had become even believers of Paul's gospel and became members then of the body of Christ. All right, even so then, verse 5, at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. In other words, they were not coming in under the Judaism and the law and the prophets. They were coming in under Paul's gospel. All right, now I ran across an interesting point the other night in one of my classes. I don't remember where it was, but turn with me to 1 Corinthians. And it brought about an interesting point that I'd never really thought of before. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. And this all fits that whole concept that for this age of grace, not only back in ancient Israel, but in this age of grace, God is only expecting the few, not the many, the few. All right, now look how the Apostle Paul puts it. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 22. To the weak I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save how many? Some. Now let's look what Peter was trying to do. Back off with me to Acts. I think that's chapter 4. Now I didn't intend to do this, so bear with me if I don't find it. Yeah, chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. What a difference. What a difference. Peter is now preaching and appealing to the nation of Israel in hopes of Christ yet returning and setting up the kingdom. That's what he says up there in verse 20, that if Israel would repent, then God would send Jesus Christ, in verse 20, who was preached unto you. But verse 26 sets the criteria. Got it? Acts 3, verse 26, unto you first. Well, who's the you? Israel. That's who he's preaching to, the nation. So unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away some of you from your iniquities. Uh-uh, <laughs> that's not what it says. How many? Every one of you. Now, what does every one mean? Every one. So Peter wasn't just looking for a little remnant there. He wants the whole nation to embrace Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, and then God would send him and set up the kingdom. But see, Paul knows better than that, and he doesn't try to win the whole nation, but reckon, reckoning instead that he can only win a small remnant. And so it's always been. Now, I can think of another one. Let's go back to Matthew 24. My, I'll shoot the whole half hour before I get out of verse 1. Matthew 24. Here's another remnant. And this is the remnant. Now, I'm, I'm glad I thought of it just before we went back to Isaiah 63. This is the remnant that's making the prayer of these verses in Isaiah. This is Israel's final remnant. All right, Matthew 24, jump in at verse 15. Matthew 24, verse 15. I'll give you time to find it because, like I've said before, our television audience begs us, slow down, slow down. I can't find them fast enough. So Matthew 24, and we're going to jump in at verse 15. Now I got a 
wake people up once in a while with a smile. I hope people don't mind that. I had a call the other day, and he said, Les, I admit this is going to be the most stupid question you have ever had. But he said, I told my pastor that I knew it was a stupid question, but he wouldn't even bother to answer it was so stupid. <laughs> and this was his question, and it will make you smile. How did the writers of Scripture know when to pick up the red-inked pen? <laughs> did you get that? <laughs> How did they know to put the words of Jesus in red? I about cracked up. I said, do you really think that that's when it, well, he said, didn't it? No, this is just a relatively modern day invention to give us the words of Christ in red. But I said, the only thing we can ever say, no matter who wrote this book, they all wrote by inspiration. Now, it brings up another point. I had somebody call, I think it was out in Kentucky, and they had a Bible teacher in their church who said that this book was nothing more than stories and myths and legends. That maybe here and there was something that was God speaking, but for the most part it was story. And I said, listen, you go back and sh tell that guy that every word of this book is Holy Spirit inspired. You know, I've, I picked this up years ago when I was reading an article where somebody made the comment, Luke must have been a tremendous diarist in order to have the facts and figures of everything that happened for his gospel account as well as what happened in Paul's journeys and so forth. No, Luke didn't have to keep a diary. Luke didn't have to chase all over the country asking people, well, do you remember this situation? Do you continue? No, Luke wrote how? As the Holy Spirit inspired him to write. And never forget that. Those of you out in television, if you con are confronted about somehow or other that there's less than inspiration, every word of this book was Holy Spirit inspired. Even if they did remember the details, that isn't what they wrote. They wrote what the Holy Spirit inspired them to write. Never forget that. All right, now we'll drop back in at Matthew 24, verse 15. Yes, this is the words of the Lord Jesus. And remember, Matthew 24 is all tribulation ground. He starts right off at the beginning how it's going to open up. But now by the time we get to the midpoint, he can refer back to Daniel. Verse 15, he says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now that's from the words of the Lord himself. Daniel was a prophet. What does that mean? He was legitimate. He wasn't just telling tales and legends. He was a prophet, inspired of God. All right, now when you see that which was written by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever readeth, let him understand, then. Now we've got to go back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. We've got to do this quickly because, again, I didn't intend to do this, no way, shape, or form. But evidently, it's what we need to do. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And this has to do with that 490-year period of prophecy concerning the nation of Israel. But 483 of them were fulfilled at his first advent and the cross. And the other seven have never yet been fulfilled. But we look at the situation today. It's getting pretty close. We think it's about to come upon the world. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And this is the final seven years of that 490-year prophecy from the pen of Daniel. All got it? Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Now, this is the verse that Jesus is referring to in Matthew 24. And he, the prince that shall come, the Antichrist, and he will confirm the covenant with many... Now, I think that includes the whole Arab world with the nation of Israel. They'll finally get peace in the Middle East because of this man. But it's going to be a supernaturally done thing because it's prophecy being fulfilled. God will now be in it. All right, so he will confirm or make a covenant with many for one week or for seven-year period. 
It'll be a seven-year peace treaty between the Arab world and Israel. All right, and in the middle of the week, now watch this carefully. In the middle of the week, or at the end of three and a half years, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation, or temple worship, to stop. Now, I put this on program years ago, and here's the way I put it. Can you stop something that's never started? Well, no. So when did it start? At the beginning of the seven-year treaty. That's one of, the, one of the statements of the treaty, that the Arabs will permit Israel to build a temple up on the Temple Mount. Why, you wouldn't dream of such a thing happening today. But it's going to, because like I say, God is going to supernaturally bring it about. And so the Arab world will permit Israel to build the temple up on the Temple Mount. They'll reinstitute temple worship. Everything is ready, remember, over there in Jerusalem. The mannequins are clothed with the cloaks of the priests, and they've got all the shovels and everything for the altar of sacrifice. They're all ready to go. And so when this peace treaty is signed and Israel gets the temple, they'll have it for three and a half years. And that's why Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that what will they say? Peace and safety. Oh, they're going to think the world has finally arrived. Peace has come to the Middle East. And Israel will be euphoric. After all, they're going to have permission to once again get up on the Temple Mount. But what happens? In the middle, at the end of three and a half years, in the middle of the week, he, the Antichrist, shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to stop. And for the overspreading of abominations, he's going to turn on Israel with the most horrible persecution the Jew has ever experienced. And he will make it, that is the temple, desolate. And until the consummation or the end of the seven years, all that's determined shall be poured upon the desolator. All right, now we can flip back to Matthew and probably get a little sense out of it. So this is what Jesus is referring to. What Daniel the prophet wrote concerning these final seven years, how that in the, in the center or the middle of the seven years, he's going to go into the temple and defile it. Now this is what he's referring to. When you therefore see the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist will go into that rebuilt temple, now it won't be a fancy Solomon's temple. I'm of the impression that it's probably stocked someplace in a warehouse in Jerusalem. It'll be a prefab. It'll barely be functional, and they can get with temple worship once again. Now, you know, an interesting thing happened in Israel just a couple weeks ago. They reformed the ancient Sanhedrin. Unheard of. And even the Jews were just beside themselves with, with awe that once again, after hundreds and hundreds of years, they have a Sanhedrin or Sanhedrin, however you like to pronounce it. And some of the Jews were so euphoric that they literally announced to the press that this can only mean one thing. The coming of their Messiah is getting close. Well, if they think the coming of Messiah is getting close, we better agree. Because we like to think so as well. All right, time's going by. Let's read on. Verse 16. Then let them who be in Judea flee to the mountains. And now he goes down and he gives us a cross-section of any society. Here we go. Verse 17, let him who is on the housetop, probably retired folks who have enough that they don't have to be out there in the fields working every day. So let him on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him who is in the field. In other words, the working class. Now today, of course, that will be scientists and professional people and college people and you name it. Not so much agricultural anymore, but all the cross-section of the working class are lopped into this one word, he that is in the field, do not return back to take his clothes. Time will be of the essence. Woe unto them that are with child and to them that are nursing. Pray that your flight be not in the winter nor on the Sabbath day, because after all, they're back under the what? They're back under the law. And the law stipulated they couldn't walk more than three-quarters of a mile. Well, that wouldn't even get them out of town. So all of this falls in place now that this is what I've always called, and you've seen me put on the board, the escaping remnant. The escaping remnant. Now, we've got just enough time, I think, to go back to Zechariah. That's the next to last book in your Old Testament. I use it quite often. Zechariah chapter 13 
And I think this is the remnant. It's going to be a little more than one or two percent. It's going to be one third. One third of the Jews living at the time all this happens will be the remnant. Zechariah chapter 13, and we'll drop in at verse 8. Zechariah 13, verse 8. And if this doesn't all fit, then I don't know what does. All got it? And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third part shall be left therein. And now what's going to happen to the third? I will bring the third part through the fire, that is, of tribulation, and I will refine them as silver is refined. I will try them or test them as gold is tested. They shall call in my name, and I will hear them, and I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. Now we're going to see in our next program that this is basically what these prayer type people in Isaiah are saying. And that's why I'm going to try and tie the two together, that this is that tribulation remnant that Isaiah is foretelling back there in chapter 63, 64, 65, and so forth. All right, now then, this is what I feel, the remnant that Jesus is referring to in Matthew 24. And uh, they're going to just all of a sudden get a providential desire to flee the city. And one way or another, he's going to gather them together out in the mountains or the deserts or wherever. And they're going to be protected. They're going to be saved for all the last three and a half years of to uh, torment and tribulation. And I feel, I am not saying that this is what the scripture adamantly says, but I feel that at the end of that three and a half years, they're going to witness the return of Christ coming in the clouds of glory, and every last one of those Jews are going to what? There's my God. And they will become suddenly believers that Jesus was indeed their Messiah, and that he has now returned to set up the king, the kingship, and uh, the throne in Jerusalem. And that will be this remnant that we're going to be talking about throughout the closing verses of the book of Isaiah. So it all fits that they will flee, they will be spared, and God will bring them through. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.